let's get started, guys. Um, what did I want to say? Let me think. So today we're gonna cover. Um, some people might like this topic, others not. But it's uh, basically a group of techniques that we use a lot in molecular biology. Uh, if you're going to research, this is probably going to be interesting for you. If not, it's just learning stuff by heart, pretty much. Um, so before I get into that, uh, just a few reminders for next week. So there's no, no quiz on Monday, no tutorial on Monday, because it's Easter. Um, if you want to still go to the tutorial, you can go on Wednesday. If you cannot, unfortunately, can't do much about that. Uh, but you can contact your TA if you need help with the questions, okay? The quiz will be done on Wednesday. It will be online for everyone, okay? So plan for that. Um, what else? Yep. I probably, probably, yeah. Uh, but I'll leave it, I think, for the whole day or something because I don't know what people are doing, right? Um, is there anybody that cannot do the final other than the group of four students that came to see me on the 23rd? For religious reasons, not because uh, <laughs> you have a party or whatever. Okay, so uh, for those that are not here and probably watching this a bit too late, um, you basically, if you have to send me an email by the 31st to let me know that you can't take the exam so I can schedule it for you on a different day, um, and it will be probably on the 19th of April. Um, the time, I'm not sure. I will send it to you by email, okay? So that's that. And uh, what else? What else? What else? What else? Do you guys have any questions for me up to now? No? Maybe. If you send me an email to see your exam and it didn't answer, probably I forgot because one student told me I didn't answer. So uh, if you send me an email for the midterm today, just come. Okay, even if I didn't reply. Okay, um, without further ado, let's get into this. So today we're gonna cover a few techniques in um, molecular biology, and it's just, these are techniques that are used uh, currently in the lab to play with <coughs> genes, okay? So the first example we'll be taking uh, a look at is how to produce the protein, uh, the insulin protein, okay? so. The way scientists do this is that they will take a human. So this is one way of doing it. There are many other ways to do it. But let's take a look at this example here. So this technique uh, was created to basically produce a high amount of a protein by using bacteria. OK, so what these scientists did is that they took the insulin gene mRNA from uh, the mRNA from human pancreatic cells, which are the cells that produce insulin in your body and they then extracted this mRNA. So this here, you can use a kit that you buy uh, online. It's very simple. You follow the steps and you'll extract the RNA. Usually it's uh, just an ethanol precipitation. And then you convert the mRNA into cDNA. So cDNA is the same thing as DNA. The only difference is that cDNA comes from the mRNA. And so it does not have any um, intron, okay? So this is the complementary DNA. Remember this, it's important. And the way you go from mRNA to cDNA is by using a protein called reverse transcriptase, which you've seen previously, and we'll look at it in a bit. So when you have your cDNA, the reason why you're converting it into cDNA, it's just so that you can later on amplify it using a technique called PCR, which we'll also look at in a few minutes. And so what this does is that you basically copy this uh, cDNA uh, multiple times, and you'll have many copies of the cDNA, which then you'll use to produce these recombinant plasmids. So on the plasmid uh, that we studied, there are sites where you can cut the plasmid using these molecular scissors, let's call them, okay? These are the restriction en enzymes that you probably heard of. So what you do is you grab the cDNA that you produced, you cut it with a specific restriction enzyme. You use the same enzyme to cut the plasmid. This way you have the same ends um, at the end of the plasmid and the cDNA, and then you ligate them together. So what this does is that it will insert your cDNA into the plasmid, which you can then use 
which you can then use and introduce into bacteria. And ba why bacteria? Because bacteria are able to produce a large amount of plasmids because they're very fast at replicating, right? So when you amplify this uh, kind of plasmid that you have, then you can use it and put it into a another bacterium. And uh, what we'll, we'll, this will do is that the bacterium will use that plasmid to produce the insulin protein, which you can then extract, purify, and sell. Easy? Okay. So there are this thing here, there's people using it for many things. Basically, after I think second year of uh, university, you'll probably be able to do this whole thing by yourself. And uh, like, for example, Dylan that I pr uh, introduced to you guys um, is using some sort of technique like this to produce high value metabolites. Okay. And you sell those. So it's very easy. Uh, the only problem that you have you encounter here is by trying to get the right restriction enzymes and the right reading frame and then getting everything into the right order. But there are softwares that help you to do that, okay? Um, if you wanna dabble with this, I'll just show you one quickly. It's called Benchling, and you can try to cut your own genes and uh, put them in there and play with this, okay? So this software here, just make an account, copy some sort of DNA sequence and try to play with it. It will show you the plasmid, the cut sites and all that, okay? This is just for you. Never know, maybe it will end up into a big business, okay? <laughs> so, this is how you play with uh, DNA pretty much. You cut, you put back. So, there are many different techniques to do this. But after you do that, you have to verify that you're actually doing the right thing, right? And uh, you didn't insert, for example, your gene uh, out of frame, and so the protein is not made. So, there are techniques to, do, to verify the levels of DNA, RNA, and protein, and these are outlined here. So these guys were not very creative, but basically to look at DNA, you use a southern blot, which is your agarose gel, if you've ever seen this. The RNA is a northern blot, and the <laughs> protein is a western blot, okay? The only thing that changes between these is the composition of the gel that you use, and I'll show you that in a second, as well as the probe. So for a protein, you'll be using typically a, an antibody, that will recognize the protein that you have. While for RNA and DNA, you'll be using a radio labeled uh, primer specific for your gene, okay? Western blood is highly, highly uh, problematic. This, I spent like six months of my postdoc trying to figure out how to do this because it was not reproducible at all. I don't know why it still exists as a technique, but uh, it's there. So. In vitro, this is in cells, uh, basically in tubes. There's also in vivo techniques, which are more into tissues and all that. Uh, so if you are looking for a protein, you'll use immunofluorescence. This is under the microscope, for example, or um, other techniques I'm not gonna get into. And then for DNA and RNA, there's this uh, term in situ hybridization, which is similar to uh, fluorescence here, but kind of different. So you don't need to learn these by heart. This is just for you as, a, as an idea, okay? The way we work with these molecules is very simple. You have techniques to modify them, you have techniques to extract them, and you have techniques to measure them. It's always the same. You modify, you extract, you, you quantify, right? And these are the main ones usually, yeah. No, no, no. no. Um, the only thing you need to know are the southern and northern blood. There are the southern and northern blood, and you'll see why when we talk about sequence. So we can create these probes based on uh, the information that we have. For example, if you're looking at the expression of an mRNA, you can create a probe for this. All you have to do is create the primer that's specific for uh, this gene, and then radio label it and then use it to detect the protein. So for example, in here, when you make your uh, plasmid here, you can either sequence it, which is a little bit expensive, but not anymore, or you also can use just a PCR. And if you see that your, pro, your gene is amplified, that means that you actually did the right thing and you have the right insertion and all that. For the protein, what you're going to do is you're going to, to use an antibody against that protein. So for example, 
In this case, you will extract the proteins and then you will take a look at those proteins under Western blood to see if you're making insulin or not. And obviously you can play with this to make more insulin or less insulin based on your construct here. Um, and then you verify that using Western blood because your end goal is to make a lot of insulin so you can sell it, right? So this is approximately uh, what it is. Now in mammalian uh, organisms, the genes are very similar. They have similar sequences. And so you can usually create a, um, a probe that is specific for both mouse and human, for example, because it will detect both of them because they have a similar sequence. And usually it's not just human and mouse, it's also rabbit, et cetera, okay? So the gels. The gels, uh, there's three types, as I said. Uh, the ones that are important for you are the southern and northern blots because they deal with DNA. And so these gels are very simple to make. They're made of something called agarose, and this agarose will create kind of a network where DNA will pass through. Now, if you put an electric current across, so let's say you put your DNA, if you put an electric current across this gel, what's going to happen is that the smallest DNA pieces will travel faster and the biggest pieces will stay at the top because they're very slow at traveling. And so you can separate your DNA based on the molecular weight of that DNA. So if you know that insulin, for example, is a certain size, then you can see where that band is and then extract the band and then do stuff with it, okay? Similar with proteins, if you know your protein size and you're using the antibody, then you'll be able to see, depending on the molecular weight of your protein, where it is uh, using that probe, okay? And uh, this is based on size and charge because charge also affects this process. And so these two, two properties are important for gels, the size of whatever you're studying and the electric charge. So let me tell you about this uh, blotting technique here. Uh, what did I want to say? So again, southern blotting for DNA, northern is for RNA, western is for protein. Unfortunately, I don't have any trick for you to learn this, so <laughs> uh, figure it out. Um, but uh, so the most important southern blotting and northern blotting, they use radio labeled uh, phosphorus. And they use just a primer that is complementary to the sequence, to the gene that you are studying or the mRNA that you are studying. So for example, the insulin mRNA, you can create one that is radio labeled and use it in the blotting technique to detect your mRNA, okay? For Western, there are fluorescent antibodies or chemiluminescence, but we don't care about this so much in this course. Am I going too fast? No? Okay, good. So the way this works, you'll make a gel, as I said, and this gel is just a network of some sort of polymer. In this case, it's going to be agarose. You will put your DNA or RNA into these wells and uh, you'll uh, have the markers on the first lane. So this is the uh, molecular weight. So this is something that you know, it's molecular weights. So the sample that will go here, you know each band, how big it is, okay? And you'll use it as a ruler to understand the size of your samples, okay? So when you do that, then you'll subject it to uh, electrophoresis, so just basically electricity into a buffer, and the DNA fragments will start to separate based on their size, okay? These gels are very annoying to work with, so you have to transfer it to a, uh, a membrane that is easier to play with, okay? Because the gels will break after like few minutes of working with them. So you'll use a system like this, where you will just put a membrane, uh, a membrane on top of the gel, and then you put more electricity, and then it will transfer from the gel to the membrane. So now this membrane here is very solid, and you can stain it, destain it, do whatever you want with it, store it, uh, etc. Okay. So this is what it looks like when the transfer is done. Now, You'll put it literally into a bag like this or some sort of, uh, you know, box full of your probe. And the probe is your radio labeled um, primer that is specific for your gene. In this case, we would be doing it for insulin, let's say. Uh, you run it for a few hours and then your probe will hybridize with the band that is specific for insulin. 
and so then you can detect that. Easy. So the probe that you put uh, will bind to the membrane right where your uh, gene is. Okay. And it will look like this. So then you can just expose it to x-ray to get the radio-labeled stuff. And you'll see that whatever it identified in the three samples, that must be uh, some sort of molecule that you're looking for. Obviously, they're not at the right size because this is something else. But if you're using only one, let's say, for example, you're using only one uh, probe, in the three samples, it should be at the same height. Okay. In this case, they're doing something different, but who cares? Just to not get mixed up. Now, this is very annoying. Uh, sometimes you have, like, it's not perfect. You do it like 10 times until you get it once, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so let's say, for example, you're looking for insulin, okay? And let's say insulin is 100 uh, kilo Dalton, the size. Then obviously insulin will not change size between each sample. It will be 100 kilo Dalton here, 100 here, and 100 here. So they should be at the same line, right? In this case, there are different places, so probably they're using three probes or something else. Um, actually, no, because the, the way we treat the samples, uh, you'll try to turn them all into the same charge or something like this. So you have to, there are, this is like the, <laughs> the, the, the basic steps, but you, you're playing with the charges and all that. Yeah, the protein, you have to denature it, remove the uh, disulfide bonds, etc. So it's not just like this. <laughs> you prepare it so that when you run it on the gel, it all follows the same pattern. You don't want some going this way and the others going downwards, right? Actually, this happened. Uh, when you flip the cables, you lose your sample. It just goes the opposite way. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is a, yeah, this is a optimization. You try the first time just like this, and then you see, does it work? No, okay, you increase the voltage, decrease the time, things like this until you, that's why research is trial by error, right? You have an educated guess based on what you know from the papers and all that, but it never works for your stuff. So you, from there, you optimize until uh, you get to the specific conditions for that project, right? So it's very annoying. There are better techniques to do this, but uh, yeah, it's probably one of the techniques you'll learn first when doing research, okay? What else? Just another way from the book showing the different things. Uh, let's take an example. For example, here, uh, northern is what RNA or DNA? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't even remember. Southern is DNA. Southern is DNA. So this here is RNA. This is protein. This is DNA. Okay. So if you take a look at here, the first lane here is your marker. This is just some markers that you know at which size they are. So when you see this band, if there's anything close here on the other wells, that means they're on the, of the same size, okay? And then in between, you can kind of try to guess or use a different marker. So here they're using different, uh, let me see. Okay, this, uh, later on we'll see it, but basically it's the same, it's the same thing cut with different enzymes. And so it creates different bands here, uh, just, see it as they're using a probe and it's detecting DNA, okay? We'll see why there are different sizes in a sec. Right here, actually. <laughs> so, so we've seen how to detect DNA. We've seen how to combine two pieces of DNA and use it to produce proteins. Now, there's one thing that we kind of skipped. It's the restriction enzymes that are used to cut the DNA, okay? So we'll talk about this a bit more specifically. There are hundreds of them, if not thousands, okay? And uh, they all come from different bacteria. Uh, they're used by the bacteria to do different things. Um, and they have two different patterns of cutting, okay? They either create staggered uh, cuts or blunt cuts. And this is the difference here. For example, this restriction enzyme here, BAMH1, is an enzyme that will go through the DNA and find this sequence here. And when it finds it, it will cut at these specific locations. 
So between the first G and the second G, between the first G and second G, and it will create these staggered ends. So they're like kind of a L shaped, right? Um, and then the blunt ends, the, the difference between that and the blunt ends, the blunt ends, they just cuts right in the middle. And so you have basically no uh, overhangs. Okay. This is the only thing that you need to know. So about this, so you can imagine that if you cut two pieces of uh, DNA, one from the plasmid and one from, let's say, your cDNA that you produced, <laughs> and you use BAMH1, you will both cut the DNA in this shape. And so you can see that they can come back together and inserting your gene of interest. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you have a plasmid and you use BAMH1 to cut it, it will produce this kind of motif, these overhangs here. Actually, you know what? I'll draw it. How about that? Uh, Joe, what's your question? Or remember it, okay. <laughs> so let's say, for example, you have your plasmid like this. And then there is a cut site, only one cut site for BIMH1, which is right here. So you cut there. So let's do BIMH1. So what this does is that it will create, uh, let's see. something like this, right? Okay, so this is your staggered end. So then if you have, uh, let's say your insulin gene, your insulin gene, when you cut it with BAM H1, it will also produce uh, something like this, okay? So wait, <laughs> I'm getting mixed up here, but uh, <laughs> oh God, what is happening here? Uh, oh my God, horrible. What is that? Nope. You get my point? Do I have to draw it? <laughs> this is exactly. Exactly. Sorry? One is staggered and one is, is blunt. It's not gonna work together. Yeah, not gonna work together. So this is my art skills, guys. <laughs> Anyways, so that's that. Yes, uh, Joe. Exact. Yeah, exact. So usually we use these blunt ends because they're uh, staggered ends because they're much better. They create a better structure um, when you try to combine two pieces. Now the issue with this, it's not that simple. The plasmid has like 10 uh, cut sites that are BAM H1. And so you have to figure out how to cut it in a way to get the perfect arrangement. Okay, and you have to cut each piece together and then see if it inserted this way or this way, etc. Okay, yes. The insulin fragment. Um, so let's go back, I'll show you. So you take a human pancreatic cell, that's the one that produces the insulin, right? And then you take the mRNA, extract it. Oh, let me just go here. You extract the mRNA, you convert it into cDNA, and then you cut that cDNA and put it in the plasma. Make sense? Yeah, then you put it there and that's it. So is that, let me go back to, where was I? Here. Okay. So that's that. So you're probably gonna practice this in the tutorial. I'll send you problems about this, but the problems are related to cutting DNA pieces using a certain enzyme and then producing certain fragments. So you'll have the length of the DNA. Let's say, for example, it's uh, 10 uh, kilobases. Then uh, if there's a BAMH1 cut site in the middle, then you'll produce two fragments of five, etc. And then the questions that are going to be asked on the exam and probably on the quiz is to read a gel based on the size, right? So I told you that the ones that travel the most are the smallest, the ones that travel the least are the biggest, and then based on that map, try to figure out the cut sites where they are, okay? So you'll cut it with different enzymes and you'll get different size fragments and try to figure out the position of those cut sites, okay? That's, uh, I'm telling you what's on the exam right now, so take notes, okay? <laughs> yeah, the exam, yeah. 
um, even if I tell you the whole thing, I'm still gonna get students <laughs> that are not gonna kill the exam, so it's okay. <laughs> um, what else? So there are other ways to clone DNA, okay? So what we are doing right now is cloning pieces of DNA. <laughs> Cloning just means copying the DNA. So for example, if you're using a human chromosome and you want to clone a gene from it, you'll take that DNA piece and then you'll produce primers that are at the extremities of the gene that you, are, you want to clone. And then you'll use a technique called polymerase chain reaction. So it's a chain reaction of you know, syn DNA synthesis and it will just make copies of that gene. So producing if you continue this cycle, you'll end up with just this yellow part together, okay? Then you can extract the DNA and use it to do whatever you want. Okay, want it? It's okay, you sure? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Isabel, Isabel is. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty much it. Uh, the way this works is through um, heating and uh, you know, DNA, to denature the RNA, uh, DNA. So what you will do is that you'll use a specific temp temperature to open the DNA apart. Then you'll use a different temperature to uh, have this uh, polymerase bind to the DNA. So these are just changes in the temperature. And then you'll use another temperature to ligate back together uh, the pieces, okay? So basically what you're doing is that you're heating, increasing the heat and decreasing many cycles uh, to just get these DNA molecules to open up, the primers to anneal, and then uh, the RNA, uh, DNA polymerase to bind, and then them to go back together, etc. And yep. Exact, exact. Yep. Uh, it's different, different. So this tag polymerase here, you'll hear it uh, often. Uh, I think it's called thermo something aquaticus. It's a uh, polymerase that is resistant to heat and it can handle 72 degrees uh, Celsius, which is not normal for a protein. And so um, this is the one that's usually used for this process here. This PCR thing here was also the same one that was used to detect COVID, right? If you remember this, and it's the same one to detect HIV, etc. So this is a very important technique to know. And one of the simplest to do, it looks complicated, but actually the most annoying part is just designing the primers because you need to find good primers that are not, so the, that are going to anneal at the temperature that you're studying. Because if you have too much, for example, GC content, so the G and C connections, they're harder to break. So you need a higher temperature, right? So this is the only problem that you have with this technique, obviously unrelated to the course. I'm just teaching you this stuff here. So when you do this PCR reaction, what happens is that first it will be slow. Uh, you can use also fluorescent uh, probes to detect the levels of PCR product, okay? And uh, when you do this, what's going to happen is that the cycles will start. You'll have just, you know, if you have, let's say one molecule of DNA, then you have two, three, four, five, six, until a certain point where it starts, you know, it becomes exponential, right? until it reaches a plateau. So this is things that you have to take into consideration when you're doing research. And uh, by looking at the displacement of these two curves, you can see that this one started peaking before the other one. That means this one has more DNA than this one here. Does that make sense? Kind of? Yeah. So let's say, for example, you, you have two samples and you're looking for the insulin gene in them, right? You'll, you, you'll do PCR and you'll use a fluorescent tag. So when the fluorescence starts increasing, that means it's being detected, right? And so you can see here that the fluorescence for sample A starts peaking before sample B. So that means sample A had more starting material. Sorry? No, it had more copies of uh, the insulin. Yeah, because these could be just extracts from cells or whatever. And so one cell could be expressing more insulin than the other. And so you would detect it through this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, the, the, of the gene of interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you're always using a probe here. Again, it's the same one, it's the prime, primer. Cool? Simple? No? Yeah, it's a lot of by heart, so I don't like this, but c'est la vie. Uh, what was this uh, slide? Yep. Yeah. There are these primers. So you just design a primer against whatever sequence you're trying to study, and then you'll use a... Um, just leave it as the primer, okay? <laughs> it's gonna be easier this way. But there's a there's a fluorescent thing also that comes into play and that will bind between the two DNA molecules that you're making, but irrelevant for us, okay? Uh, what else? So reverse transcriptase. This we saw for telomerase, for example, right? Where you have a piece of RNA and you're trying to make DNA from it. So usually when you're studying mRNA, you will not study it as is because mRNA is very sensitive, and so it will get degraded by pretty much anything, and you cannot store it for a long time. So what you do is you convert it to this complementary DNA, which is just, again, as I mentioned earlier, a sequence of DNA based on the mRNA. So it does not have any introns, none of the additional stuff, just directly from the mRNA, the protein coding to the complement to uh, DNA, okay? And it has the same uh, ideas behind it. Um, so if your mRNA is from 5 to 3, then your cDNA is from uh, 3 to 5, etc. The cap is not present though. The cap is an mRNA modification. Remember that. Yeah, so it's always uh, the same story. So if you have a DNA molecule and you're copying that, the template will be, let's say, 3 to 5, then the copied one will be 5 to 3. And then same thing with the mRNA uh, and the cDNA. So if your mRNA is 5 prime to 3 prime, then your cDNA will be 3 prime to 5 prime. You can take a look at this one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And synthesis, no matter where you are, it's always from five to three, right? And you know this because of the sugar backbone, right? That we learned in lecture something, chapter seven, I guess. So anything is built from five to three because of the DNA molecule. This is what I just showed you on the board here, my uh, ugly drawing there. So if you take your gene of interest and you cut it with a certain restriction enzyme. Let's say, for example, here it's eco R1. It will create staggered blunts like this. And then you take a vector that you have to also cut by eco R1 and not something else because these need to be to bind to each other. And then you can just anneal them. Annealing is just bringing them back together, sticking them together. And uh, then you use a ligase to put everything back together. Okay. Uh, what are they showing here? Obviously, you can start cutting with a combination of enzymes, okay, and it can get pretty complicated depending on what you're trying to achieve. So the basic is the left one here where you have just one enzyme you're working with, but this is never the case almost. So sometimes you'll use combinations of, um, of these enzymes, restriction enzymes. And there are softwares that exist online for you to do this. You don't do this by hand anymore. People used to spend their whole postdoc just building one of these, right? So we've gone so far compared to before, you're actually able to make like, these every day almost, okay? So that's that. I thought I removed this, but uh, okay, forget this slide because I removed it, but I don't wait here. Um, that's, which slide is this? Anyways, just watch the video. Um, now for DNA, let's say for example, you build this plasmid, and you want to put it into your cells. We learned this in uh, chapter seven, uh, chapter six, seven, seven. So there are three ways to do it. Either you use uh, transformation, right? So transformation is just the pickup of uh, the plasmid by the bacteria from the environment. You can induce this because this happens rarely, but there are ways to induce it. For example, if you uh, make small holes in the bacteria using electricity or some sort of chemical, the membrane will open up a little bit and then your plasmid can go in. Recently, there are these nanoparticles that were created uh, 
uh, that you put your plasmid in them and then they will just fuse with the membrane and put the uh, plasmid inside. If you want to Google this, it's called lipofectamine. Um, and then the best way that I find works the best is by using viruses. So you can package these viruses using your plasmid and then they serve literally as needles. Uh, they will just go inject the DNA and then leave. Okay. We, yep. No. Yep, exactly. Phosmids here, it's just a different type of plasmid. It's a bigger one. Yeah, the two. Yeah, uh, yeah B and C are transduction. And uh, here it's uh, transformation. You're, uh, I don't know why they're calling it like this. Both of them are kind of infections. It's just this one here kind of kills the cells. Okay. So th that's why it's kind of an infection. But both of them are transduction. Okay. Um, here you're transforming plasmids and uh, these uh, bags. I forgot the, the acronym there. Barely use them. Mostly it's plasmids. And uh, these are very small, so it's okay to do it through transformation. But if you have something big, bigger, like phosmids or bacteriophage vectors, then you'll need transduction because you cannot make holes in the cell this big. Uh, you'll basically kill the cell. Okay, yeah. Right, so what I do, exactly. So I take these, uh, let, you can use any uh, bacteriophage or whatever. You fill it with whatever you, you want to amplify basically the uh, viruses that you have there. And then you can use them to infect, keep amplifying. Okay. Obviously, when you're studying these, uh, you're using systems that have been uh, removed, like they don't infect you, okay? <laughs> because working with viruses can actually be quite dangerous. So uh, there are these systems that are built that don't react with you. Because if you're working, let's say, for human cells, and you're using this kind of system, well, you know that those viruses you're working with, they can infect you because you're human cells too, right? And so there are ways to deal with this. Um, and that's where you see it in the movies with all those big masks there and all that, uh, depending on how crazy the virus is. Okay. Uh, I don't know why there's a duplicate stuff here, but uh, same thing, restriction enzymes, useless. We've seen this already. Okay. So let's say, for example, you have a clone. You have a clone, you want to amplify it in bacteria. There are ways to kind of figure out if those bacteria have a clone or not, right? So when you put the clone inside the bacteria, then you have to select for them. The easiest way is to use an antibiotic uh, if your plasmid has the antibiotic. If it doesn't, then you can use also this technique here. So you'll insert in your bacteria um, these phosmids or plasmids or whatever it is, okay? Then you'll put a membrane on top of it because this agar gel here is not very, it's very sensitive, so you don't want to do work on it. So you transfer the colonies onto a membrane and then you'll break them apart. So each colony will become kind of just a small puddle, let's say, of you know uh, cell content. And then you can use this with a radioactive isotope to see against your plasmid to see if those bacteria have that plasmid. Okay. And you can x-ray them like this, and it will tell you which colony has that plasmid. And then you can then go back to the initial plate and pick up that colony and amplify it. This is, yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is pretty useless unless your plasmid does not have a selectable mar marker. For example, the gene for resistance to tetracycline or ampicillin. Now, all what we do is we fill the agar and we add the antibiotic to it. And so when you add that, only the bacteria that have the selectable marker will survive. And to get the selectable marker, you need the plasmid inside. Okay? Yeah. Clone. Yeah, exactly. So if you put, so each one of them comes from one bacteria, pretty much. Uh, they're clones. Uh, we call them either clones or colonies, maybe plaques you're referring to, that's for viruses, the plaques. Yep. So the selectable marker is the plasmid? The plasmid has a selectable marker on it. So the plasmid is multiple genes, 
you will usually have your gene of interest that you just put there by cutting DNA and putting it back together. But you also have selectable markers, for example, a gene for resistance to uh, an antibiotic. So to, to see if your bacteria took that plasmid, you will use antibiotic into the agar plate. Those that did not pick up the plasmid will die. That was on the uh, exam, first midterm, <laughs> right? Uh, the only midterm, I mean. Uh, what else? What else? What else? As you can see, today's slides are coming from the book, so uh, I'm uh, discovering at the same time as you guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, they just keep repeating the same stuff here. So, okay, exam stuff, focus. <laughs> Everyone woke up there. So um, sequencing, DNA sequencing. Let's say, for example, you inserted the gene. You don't want to do the gels. You're too lazy and you have too much money. You can also just sequence, OK? So sequencing, all you do is that you will add a base pair to the DNA and see if it sticks or not. And that's pretty much it. This is the one of the oldest techniques. It's called Sanger sequencing. And it uses a, uh, a simple system with dideoxy nucleotides. So DNA is deoxy nucleotides. Dideoxy means the two OHs are gone. Okay. What this means is that when polymerase will go through the DNA, it will not be able. So when the dideoxy is added, it will not be able to continue uh, copying the DNA. And so it will stop there. So what that does is that you will have different fragments of different sizes. And if you run them through the gel, technically you should have one band at each weight, molecular weight. And so you can read the, the, the gel from bottom to top to see what's the sequence that you have. Why from bottom? Because the smallest is the bottom one. So the smallest here is this one here. And then the top here is this whole thing here. So if you read here, it will be C, and then T, right? And each lane contains the uh, the dideoxy nucleotide. Yeah. Is a nucleo. Yeah. Yeah. So if you start reading from here, it will be a C, right? And that's the one here. And then if you read here, it will be T. So it's C T, and then you have a G, etc. Make sense? So C T. G, G, A, etc. Okay. Uh, yes, Joe. <coughs> it's always like this. Smallest one is at the bottom because it can travel faster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Downwards. Yeah. Usually you put the DNA at the top and then you let it run through electricity. The fastest one is the smallest one and this one is the biggest one. And if you take a look, it says C. And the last one here is a C. Cool. This is very old. Uh, there are better ways to do this. Yes. Um, how what? F from here to here. OK. So you have a DNA sequence that you are trying to sequence. So you don't know really what it is. OK. What you're going to do is you're going to uh, add these random primers, okay? So these primers uh, usually can bind pretty much anything, okay? Um, and then you will then subject this complex here of primer and DNA template to a reaction using DNA polymerase. And then it will start copying, okay? So you will add both the regular nucleotides that we usually use, right? And then those will be added to the sequence, OK? And then you'll only add one of the nucleotides as dideoxy. This will stop the polymerase reaction because it's missing the OH, which is necessary for adding a nucleotide at the end, OK? So whenever this piece here gets added, there's a termination of uh, DNA synthesis. And so you'll end up with different fragments of different sizes in the same sample. That, we, that you will put in the gel, right? And then the smallest one will travel here, the second smallest here, and then you can read it from here. Okay? Yes? Uh, 
the like why is this one sm smaller than this right so let me do it here so what happens is that when you put when you put a sample that has multiple molecules of different sizes in it and then you subject it to electricity the ones that are fa smallest will travel faster like the sequence of your DNA by itself? exactly yeah the the weight or it's more the weight of the the DNA molecule How do you get one strand of DNA? Uh, so you're asking me, how do we get these? Uh, yeah, probably heating. Yeah, uh, heating. Uh, usually it's 65 degrees or something like this. Yep. So like, how come we want to see the first uh, Because it will give us the sequence of the DNA. So imagine you don't see this stuff here. Uh, this, this, All this part here, you don't see it. Okay, <laughs> all this part here, you don't see it. So you only, you, you have this sequence here that you don't even know what it is. So your goal is to figure out what that sequence is. The blue thing, the blue thing here. Exact, the order. For example, let's say I'm studying a gene that I discovered may, does something, but I don't know its sequence, right? So imagine before, we didn't know what the genome, the human genome was. So the way we sequence it is by using this to get the sequence of letters, right? And this is just a question of chemical reactions, right? So what you do is forget the primer here because uh, I don't want you to mix it up, but there are random primers that you can use which find <coughs> pretty much anything, okay? So then uh, you will add these nucleotides and they will be added at the end of the sequence, right? And uh, you also have to add these uh, dideoxynucleotides and so when the DNA polymerase is copying sometimes it will insert the regular nucleotides but sometimes when it reaches for example this A here it will add this DDTTP right and it will stop the reaction because DNA polymerase cannot continue because this here is a dideoxy and it does not have the OH to make sense? So, okay, I see what you mean. Let's do it on the board. So imagine I have four tubes. Okay, tube number one, two, three, and four. So in all tubes, I'll put the same thing, okay? So these same, same things are DNA pole, DNA polymerase one. I will add also, uh, so in this case here, I will add the ATP, uh, no, DD, ATP. And then for the others, they will be regular. So D, uh, CTP, D, uh, GTP, and then D, T, T, P. Make sense up to now? All the tubes have this, and then this one here, has this that is special. Now in this case, I will do something else. I will add DD, CTP, and then the rest will be the regular ones, okay? So D, D, A, and D, T, okay? Same here, it will be D, D, G, T, P, and then D, D, okay. So then I take my DNA, well, a sample of DNA that I want to sequence, I'll add the exact same amount in each one of them. So same amount. And then I will run the reaction. So what happens is that when it starts copying here, if it's one of these here, it will continue copying. The moment on the DNA strand there is a T, it needs to add an A, right? So it will add an A and block, it will stop copying. Okay, and so in here you'll end up with multiple fragments of that uh, DNA uh, molecule. And then you run each one in a lane on the gel. Ça fait du sens? Okay. No problem. Time is it. So then this is how you can sequence 
a small uh, DNA molecule. Now, obviously, this is not very useful. There are new ways of doing this. You use fluorescent probes, and these probes will your basically your nucleotides are fluorescent, and so every time one is added, it will just fluoresce and make a light uh, wavelength that is uh, linked to that nucleotide. And you can see it like this. This here, for example, if you're mutating a single nucleotide, you can use it to verify if, for example, this G was actually muta mutated into an A or whatever. We use this a lot in the lab, OK? How many slides is there? So I can uh, figure out. Not bad. Am I going too fast? We're good? Yep. Uh, wait, repeat that. Sorry. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you can compare it here. So let's say, for example, you have your primer here. First letter that is added is a C, right? And then second one is a T. So you have here, you see it's a C, and then it's a T. The band here counts. And then the next one is G. So you can take a look at C, T, G. You exact. You convert it to the other one, and you'll know the G. No problem. Okay. Uh, what is this here? So there are other ways to add DNA to cells, depending on what you're working with. You can uh, the ones that we. Uh, talked about, for example, the lipofectamine I told you about, which is just a way to transform DNA. You can use these lipid bilayers, cover your DNA molecule with it, and this lipid bilayer will interact with the plasma membrane of the cell that you're trying to put DNA into, and then just inject it like this. You can also use electricity. Uh, electrical pulse will open up the membrane just enough so that small DNA molecules can enter. If your molecule is too big, this is not a good way to do it because you don't want to open pores in the membrane that are too big and kill the cell. Okay. You can also just shoot the cell with this kind of gun here. I've never seen this, but um, <laughs> the DNA molecule will go right through in. Um, I think this is bullshit. Never seen this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So you have your cells in a tube, and you have your other cell, your complex in another tube, and then you just combine it together. This here? Yeah, they're in a tube. You just electro you put your DNA and the cells together, add some electricity in there, and then it will go in. Yeah, you can also heat shock them. So heat also opens up pores. Uh, Any way it works. Micro injections usually are used when you're working with uh, mice or things like this. And uh, viruses, we just learned about it. OK? A lot of information today. So there's another way to. Uh, so we talked about how we can use plasmids to express a protein kind of in an artificial way inside a cell. But there are also ways that you can replace one gene inside the cell by a modified gene that you would bring with a plasmid. And so. For example, let's say you have uh, the gene that uh, affects, I don't know, the cystic fibrosis, okay? It's one gene, okay? Uh, so you have the bad version in your body and you want to put the, the good version that is healthy in your body. So what you can do is produce a plasmid like this that contains the good copy and then put it into your cells. And what will happen is that the cells will switch up both uh, the bad copy with the good copy using crossovers. But for, you, for this to happen, you need to flank both sides of the gene with sequences that are similar so that they can recombine. So if you know that in, on your chromosome you have the gene for cystic fibrosis, then you look behind it and after it to see what sequence is here, and you use the same on your uh, plasmid. And then what the cell will do is it will just cross over and insert the good one and leave with the bad one. Yeah. It happens by itself. It's just based on the sequences here. 
they need to be the same. Okay? Um, they need to be the same so that when they get close to each other, there's a flip that happens, and this one here goes in, and the other one goes up. Yeah? Actually, uh, there are clinical trials that are doing this right now, but not using this homologous recombination system. They're using CRISPR. That's a much better way of doing it. I'll show you that in a second. So that's pretty much it. This is dangerous. That's why we're not, we're too scared about this stuff. It's like the cure for pretty much everything. The problem is that imagine this plasmid goes and inserts in a, an important gene uh, <laughs> inside, let's say, a gene that can give you cancer. So then you end up with cystic fibrosis and cancer, <laughs> right? And then it can, it can go even more wrong when there are like multiple copies of this. So that's why it's very scary. And people are like, let's first study this, okay? That's another problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of problems with this technique. It's almost good, but there's always risks with it. So in the lab, we don't care because if the cell dies, the cell dies, but not on humans. So in humans, you want to be careful. You don't want to start creating other problems, okay? This is usually used in yeast, right? Because yeast, uh, they have this system. But you can also have... Um, you can also have uh, insert DNA into uh, human cells and then change the genes that are in there using CRISPR, and I'll show you that in a second. But before that, we are a biology program, so I have to talk about plants, okay? Uh, <laughs> plants, uh, they have a special plasmid that you can use to put genes in them, and this is the plasmid that was used to create the GMOs that you heard about a few years ago. We seem to have forgotten about them. But uh, this TI plasmid here is a plasmid that is used by a specific type of bacteria called the agrobacterium to me, whatever. It's just remember the T there. Uh, so you do the same thing. You cut this plasmid and you add your gene of interest and a selectable marker using the same restriction enzymes. You put that inside the bacteria and then you can infect uh, plants. So you cut pieces of the plant, you infect them using this bacterium called agrobacterium to me fashions, whatever. And then uh, when these plants here start growing, you can then transfer them and you have a transgenic plant. This has been used, for example, to improve tobacco plants um, and pretty much any, yeah. Uh, not even, I'm just, uh, I'm just describing this thing here. <laughs> Each thing has its own plasmid. They're all cut in the same way. The genes and the selectable marker are always the same thing. Uh, just the way you do it, right? So we'll go to the next slide. <laughs> Enough about the exam, guys. Seriously. <laughs> uh, what did I want to say? Okay, so C. elegans, another organism that you'll be seeing a lot in this program the round worm. This worm is, uh, it seems stupid to study these things here, but it's actually very important. This is the first organism where we knew each cell what it did in the whole organism. And so if you want to put a transgene here, instead of using the previous techniques that I showed you, you'll use a micropipette, which just basically throws the transgene DNA and uh, they will pick it up, okay? How they will pick it up, uh, depends on what you're trying to put there. I don't want to get into the details, but um, you do this in the gonads, okay? So when you're talking about mammalian stuff like uh, multicellular organisms, you do this usually in the gonads so that the progeny will have this transgene in all the cells. Because if you just put it in one cell here, it, it's useless, right? So you want the progeny to have this gene in every cell, and that's why you put it into the gonads. There's a, yep. Oh, what's the others? Oh, uh, the mechanisms, uh, the mechanisms are different here because you're using a micro pipette and you're putting it directly into the gonads. Ah, uh? oh, the DNA itself, the gene itself. Yeah, 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 and then uh, obviously how it integrates in the DNA is same mechanisms. Yeah, 
because the cells are getting bigger, you can kind of see them under the microscope and use something to inject in them, right? It becomes easier. For example, if you're trying to engineer mice, so the scientific name for mice is mus musculus right here. And uh, you can create knock-in and knock-out mice, which is basically knock-in a gene or knock-out a gene. And the way you do this is by using a pipette to hold the egg and then inject into it the DNA because the egg is about, for humans, it's one millimeter. For mice, I think it's a little bit smaller, so you can see it under the microscope. So you just make a small hole and then put the DNA there, and it will integrate into the genome and do whatever it has to do. Okay. We'll take a look at this uh, briefly. So the way we create transgenic mice, and pretty much this could be also done for humans because we're very similar, uh, even though we don't look alike, you know, but uh, the same mechanisms, okay? <laughs> so if you have uh, mice with a certain genotype, and let's say, for example, you want to change the gene M, what you'll do is that you'll take embryonic stem cells from the mice by doing some sort of surgery, and then you will switch one of the chromosomes uh, into those cells to have, let's say, the mutation you want, okay? Then you will take a zygote or an embryo from uh, a female and then insert your mutant cells into it. So now we have a population of two different cells. So obviously you put this in a surrogate mother and it will create a chimeric uh, mice. Okay, Forget about the male, female, all that. It's going to get mixed up there. But basically this is the process. Okay, Then for you to get a pure line and not a chimeric line like this, then you do what you learned in chapter two, which is crosses and crosses and crosses until you are able to get the pure line that you want, okay? So if you're doing a project, let's say for masters or PhD in this, uh, I wish I knew this, it takes about a year to get the mice that you need. So that leaves you for masters just a year to do your experiments, okay? So think about this because I know that everyone wants to do mammalian cells and no one wants to do yeast or whatever. And it makes sense. It's just, you're not producing the same amount of data, okay? The first year are gonna be pretty much chilling the whole year and uh, just making mice babies, okay? Until you get your genotype and that's where your kind of experiments start. Cool. Last slide. I feel like I'm wrapping here. Uh, last slide, last slide. So this is the best technique ever. Uh, I tried to think of ways to improve it. There's no way to improve it, okay? <laughs> it's like perfect, okay? So there's a protein called Cas9, and it will uh, it binds an, an RNA called the guide RNA. This guide RNA, you can design it based on the gene that you're interested into replacing into the cell or cutting from the, the genome, okay? So if, for example, I want to remove the insulin gene, then I will make a guide RNA that is specific for that gene. And then insert this Cas9 guide RNA complex into the cell. And it will, what it will do, it will find that gene and it will just cut it. And it cuts it perfectly, okay? The place where it cuts it, uh, you know what? I'm not even gonna say that. Just it cuts it at specific places and creates this double strand break, which can then be ligated back together and you'll have a knockout, complete knockout of your gene. There's a Chinese researcher a few years ago that uh, took a, an embryo. Yes. I love this story. <laughs> okay, let's repeat it for those that were not there. <laughs> uh, so he used this on the babies and uh, saved the babies from HIV. This technique is probably going to be used in the future for things like preventing Huntington's disease, uh, which is caused by a single gene, uh, cystic fibrosis, etc. Okay, there's a lot of diseases that are caused by only one gene. Usually, most of the genetically inherited diseases, uh, you have one bad allele and that's it. And so, um, there are a lot of clinical trials that are using this stuff here to uh, do this. So, very promising. Um, they got the Nobel Prize in 2012, if I'm not wrong. And that's it. For the, the babies? Yeah. Yep. So uh, these two parents had both HIV. So HIV uh, is a retrovirus. So you have RNA into the particle there. And then when it's inserted into 
your cells, uh, it will be converted into cDNA by the reverse transcriptase of the retrovirus itself, and then it will insert itself into your, your DNA. And so if your, your parents have it, you will have it for sure. So what this guy did is that he took an embryo from the parents, he, rem he used CRISPR to remove the HIV gene, and then put back the embryo, and the baby survived without HIV. But the guy is, uh, the scientist that did this, is in jail uh, because that's kind of illegal according to the bioethics and all that stuff. Um, and uh, his career is also dead. <laughs> exactly. People don't want to uh, play with this stuff. You know, the Watson and the, all that stuff there. <laughs> you have to be careful. But uh, it's very promising. Yep. Pam. <laughs> okay, this is the motif that is recognized by CRISPR, okay? CRISPR is actually the immune system of bacteria, okay? This was taken from bacteria. This is their way of cutting foreign DNA. So if the foreign DNA has these sequences that it does not recognize, it will cut it, okay? And so you can use it in mammalian cells, but because we don't have, you know, we're not reacting to anything, we're actually just cutting at these sites. Make sense? But this is the uh, premature immune system that existed before. And bacteria. Yep. This thing here? Yeah. Okay. Let's take the HIV example. Okay. <laughs> so let's imagine there's a gene that causes HIV. Okay. And uh, this gene, well, let's say there are freaking 20 genes. Okay. So these 20 genes will make the virus. So when they integrate the DNA, your own DNA will be used to make that virus, and that's dangerous for you. So you want to remove that, those 20 genes. So what you will do is you will create 20 Cas9 complexes with this guide RNA. The guide RNA is specific for the gene that you are trying to cut, okay? So the guide RNA will go along the, your own DNA and find that gene and bind to it and bring this complex into place. And this complex, this protein here, its goal is just to cut the the, the DNA. Yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Obviously, there's a ligation step here where you bring everything back together. Um, so, okay, so you see this part here from here to here? Yeah. This will be cut <laughs> and brought away with the Cas9, and so you'll end up with something like this. Exact, complete. You could replace it, but there's uh, something else to use here, which I don't want to mix you up with. Okay. Exact, exact. But for, uh, for example, um, cystic fibrosis, you need to replace it because it's an important gene for uh, some channels in your lungs, and so you need it. Yeah. It's specific. It cuts exactly where it's supposed to. Uh, oh, how did it open up like this? The Cas9 does all this. Opens up, cuts the, <laughs> does everything. Uh, yeah, exactly. It just finds the complementary sequence that it's looking for, and then the rest it will open up, cut, etc. Yep. Uh, that's a very good question. I, yeah, it should be an endonuclease. It cuts in the same. No, this is a system that was taken from bacteria. We don't have this. So Cas9 is the immune system for bacteria. So what they do, right? So CRISPR stands for Cluster Regularly Interspace Short Palindromic Repeats. And these are found on the DNA. So there are specific repeats that are for you for the bacteria itself but if it feels like it's foreign so that means it's a different repeat coming from another organism that's infecting it it will use crispr to start cutting that so to protect itself and so we took this modified it a little bit and used it to cut at specific places that we are interested in we will take just the protein the cas9 and make a guide RNA for it. Cool. 
no problem. What's up, guys? You want to chill? <laughs> uh, that's pretty much it. Have yourself a good weekend. Don't party too much. <laughs>